Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ductless heating and cooling webinar, part of our energy and water educational series. My name is Lorena, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Um, we wanted to start out today with a safety moment. As you know, safety is a core value at PGE, and we want to remind you to be safe around electricity. As you consider installing a retrofit new equipment or um, bringing on um, experts to do that for you, please keep safety in mind. We also encourage your family, tenants, and staff to be prepared with an outage kit. You never know what um, Mother Nature will bring to us. So you can visit our website for more information on uh, how to prepare for safety-related issues. For today's webinar, Portland General Electric has teamed up with the Metro Multifamily Housing Association, which their new name now is the Multifamily Northwest. They, um, and the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Regional Water Providers Consortium to offer this multifamily series for property managers and owners. They're free webinars and seminars on, that have proven strategies for saving energy and water, as well as cash incentives and other available resources through these organizations. Again, all the seminars and webinars are free, and they qualify for the Oregon Real Estate Continuing Education Credit Hours. If you're interested in those, please let me know, and we'll get that going for you. Before I introduce the presenter, I would like to show you some of the tools we'll be using today. We want this to be engaging and interactive. Um, if at any point you'll notice on the right side of your screen under the participants window, there's a raise your hand icon. Um, if you have any questions you want to ask over the phone, then I'll go ahead and unmute you. Or do feel free to chat the questions to me underneath the chat window where the participants window is. Um, and we do have dedicated time at the end of the session to answer any of the questions that come through the session. At the end of the session on that same side, you'll also see a poll survey that's going to come up. We really do appreciate your feedback. And so we hope you can take a couple minutes at the end to do that. You'll also notice on the top left corner of your screen, where the quick start window is, you'll see these participation tools that you'll be able to use during the session. And the instructor will let you know when to use those. So um, you can use the arrow, the text, the highlighter. Um, again, the instructor will let you know when to use those. So Garrett, um, I'm go ahead and introduce Garrett here. He's been with PGE for, uh, has actually has done over 10 years of, has 10 years of experience in educating and advising customers on energy efficiency technologies and, and cash incentives and other uh, resources that um, the Oregon Department of Energy has. He currently is a product line manager at Portland General Electric and has received um, two degrees. Uh, he has a Lane Community College Energy Management and then also a business management degree from Linfield College. So again, Garrett comes with a wide range of experience in assisting and helping multifamily property managers and owners to get some projects and also take advantage of incentives because we all pay into that. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Garrett. Thank you, Lorena. Um, and welcome to the uh, ductless uh, heat pump or ductless heating and cooling seminar today. Um, Thanks, and thanks for joining during your lunch hour. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go over kind of an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. So first, we'll be going through typical uh, multifamily energy use, um, covering zonal electric heat because it's one of the most common um, energy or, or heating sources in multifamily properties. And then uh, mostly going to be covering the ductless heat pumps, which is the, the reason you probably joined us here today. Before we get started, I'd like to I'd like to know who you are. It'll be a little helpful in terms of uh, focusing our, our discussion. Um, so remember, using the toolbar up here uh, to your left, you can uh, select uh, who you are. Um, there's me. I'm, I'm I'm the property manager. I'll give you a few moments to actually kind of check those off so we can see who's uh, who's in the audience today. I'll give you a minute to do that. Thanks. All right, it looks like we have a wide range of folks out there today, uh, property owners, property managers, facility uh, staff, and um, some others that, that weren't that weren't identified, but some other people out there as well. 
So a little bit about uh, NIA or Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Uh, NIA is an organization that's uh, core focus is market transformation. Uh, what they focus on doing is getting the region to adopt certain technologies or energy efficiency standards to save energy. And um, what they what they do is they also do a lot of uh, research into the market and where energy is being used and so on. Um, so the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance sponsored a survey several years ago. Uh, this survey included um, about 80 tenants in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Um, so these are, you know, apartment dwellers um, to kind of get a get an idea of uh, how energy is being used in in the multifamily sector. And here are some findings for customers with uh, electric resistance heat. Um, <clears throat> the total annual, an, average annual energy consumption uh, was about 10,757 kilowatt hours uh, a year. So a kilowatt hour is our, our billing unit um, here at PGE and, and for all utilities. Um, currently, uh, the cost is a little over 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and then of that 10,757, nearly 4,000 kilowatt hours um, was used for um, heating heating the uh, space um, with baseboard, electric resistance, or um, maybe ceiling cable heat. So if you look at the the profile there of the energy consumption, the, the energy usage profile, uh, you'll really notice how it how it peaks during the um, coldest months of the year, and then um, in the summer, it's 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 going to be the lowest. Uh, so the resulting utility cost um, about $1,114 a year uh, for the customer. Uh, high bill could be over $135 a month, and uh, low bill could be uh, $60 a month. So there are a number of uh, different types of zonal electric. Um, heating systems, and here are some examples and uses. Um, so a baseboard heater, it's about 250 watts per linear foot. Uh, an hourly cost to operate a six foot uh, 1500 watt unit would be about 15.66 cents. Uh, and then moving towards monthly cost um, for a two bedroom apartment, uh, total cost might be $75, and that might be represented by two four foot and two eight foot uh, baseboard heaters. Wall heaters are another common uh, heat source. Often you'll see them with a blower motor or a fan. Um, wall units generally range between 1,500 and 2,000 watts. Uh, the range can be 750 to 4,000 though. Uh, so the hourly cost to operate a 1,500 watt model um, would be the same as, as the baseboard, uh, 15.66 cents. And uh, using this example, it would be $63 to use two 1,000 watt wall heaters and two uh, 1,500 watt wall heaters, um, four hours per day. Uh, portable space heater, uh, most are, these are the plug-in units. Uh, most are about 1,500 watts. Uh, for, so for a 1,500 watt unit, again, it's gonna be about 15.66 cents um, or $28 uh, for one space heater. Um, and one, obviously one space heater isn't going to heat an entire apartment, but sometimes tenants use these to, for supplementary or, or spot, uh, spot heating. So Energy Star has some recommendations when using zonal electric heating systems. Uh, there can be considerable savings by just simply um, adjusting the temperature settings for daytime and nighttime, unoccupied versus occupied. So uh, the Energy Star recommends uh, at the wake time, uh, temperature setting of uh, 70 degrees or less. Uh, daytime, uh, so that's 8 a.m. typically when, when people might be leaving for work and school and so on, a uh, setback of at least eight degrees. And then in the evening, uh, generally when the home is occupied again, people are back from work, school and so on, um, 70 degrees or less. And for nighttime, uh, maybe 10 to 10 p.m. or so, set back uh, eight degrees. And so for, for units that have cooling systems or window air conditioners, there's some kind of general guidelines there for cooling. Um, so keeping it um, less than 78 degrees 
um, and then setting it up um, at least seven degrees uh, during the day, um, and then the evening down to um, 78 degrees or, or less, and then uh, bumping it up a little bit at night if it's, if it's still comfortable for, for occupants in the home. So there are some simple fixes uh, for zonal electric heating systems. Um, one thing to check for is accuracy of uh, mechanical thermostats. Sometimes over time, these thermostats become inaccurate. Um, so you can verify the setting and temperature maybe with a, an additional digital newer thermo uh, thermostat or uh, thermometer um, and consider replacement if, if these aren't, um, aren't, aren't accurately uh, setting the temperature that's desired. Uh, again, set temperature based on occupancy uh, when, when possible. For example, 68 degrees when home and awake, and 60 degrees while asleep or away from the home. And setting the temperature as low as, the, as, low as, com as comfortably possible. Uh, electricity use can drop 2% for every degree that you lower the average temperature. So um, simple, simple behavioral things can help tenants uh, reduce their heating costs in, um, in their homes, even with existing electric resistance heating systems. Operations and maintenance for zonal electric heat. Um, always uh, refer to the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, it's, the manufacturer is going to trump all others. But in general, um, turn off power to the heaters to vacuum the grills and fins regularly. Um, don't allow air to circulate, and or allow excuse me, allow air to circulate, and don't block fan discharge. Um, so for the for the wall units uh, with the the blower motor and fan. And for the baseboards, leave at least one foot uh, between the baseboard and furniture. Um, you, you don't want to create any, any fire hazards and, and allow the heat to be distributed as, as best possible. Also, avoiding drafts is important. Setting temperature, all temperature zones to the same uh, or similar set points, so it, whatever it may be, 65, 70 degrees. Uh, and if, if tenants do zone the system, in other words, intentionally not heat certain areas. Uh, make sure that the areas are closed off um, when the baseboards are turned off so you're, you truly are heating uh, only one zone or several zones. So I want to do a quick survey here. Um, what is the most common heating system in your apartment units? Um, we have baseboards, wall heaters, ceiling cable, forced air. Uh, looks like somebody's already indicated that they have baseboards, and I'll use the tool again. Remember on the, the left uh, toolbar in the top left of your screen, um, there's me wall heaters. So I just want to get a sense of, of, of what kind of systems the uh, participants uh, have. So I'll give you a moment or two to, uh, to indicate what, what kind of systems your apartments have. Great, it looks like we have uh, a wide variety of heating systems. Uh, nobody with ceiling cable. Um, that, not a lot of that's still out there, but there is some. Thanks for, thanks for uh, sharing that information. So there, there are options um, for multifamily units and apartments. Um, and the new option is, is, is ductless heat pumps. Um, and one thing I wanted to note about this presentation, this webinar today, um, it's not really focused on um, the, the installation practices of ductless heat pumps. Ductless heat pumps are, are not like a window air conditioner. They're more like a, um, a traditional heat, heating system where you're going to have a contractor actually do the work for you. But we will get into a little of the details so you have a better sense of um, what an installation looks like looks like, how we, what's involved, and, and, and so on. Um, so there's a couple pictures here just to kind of give you an introductory um, view of what a, a ductless heat pump system looks like. So we have an outdoor unit there in the left-hand picture. They're, they're pretty compact. Um, and then the indoor unit, um, you can see in the right picture, um, is, is mounted quite high, to, high, high, close to the ceiling up there. Um, 
and, and they're pretty small, compact out of the way as well. How heat pumps work. Uh, so this is kind of a broad overview of how all heat pumps work. Um, basically, the concept with a heat pump is it takes less energy to move energy from one place uh, to another compared to converting electrical energy directly to heat. So when you have an electric resistance heater, let's say a baseboard, um, all the electrical energy that goes into the baseboard um, results in, in heating energy. With a heat pump, you actually get more energy out of the system, and that's because you're actually moving heat from the outdoors to the indoors. So that's, that's the big efficiency gain with heat pumps. Um, so refrigerants are used to move the heat from outside to inside uh, during heating mode. Uh, there's an outdoor coil or, or an outdoor unit uh, in the heating mode, the outdoor coil is significantly cooler than the ambient outdoor air. Um, so heat always moves from warmer areas to cooler areas, um, kind of laws of thermodynamics. Um, the heat's going to be drawn uh, from the outdoor air to that coil. Uh, the, the heat is collected by the outdoor unit and then transferred indoors uh, with a hot gas refrigerant um, from the compressor. And then there's the indoor coil, and the indoor coil is hotter than the return air blowing it, blowing over it, uh, which results in warm supply air and heats the space. And this is just a, a diagram here of a typical um, single-family home with a with a ducted heating system, a heat pump. A little more on how heat pumps work. Um, basically, a heat pump has all the same components as an air conditioner, but it also has a reversing valve that allows the heat pump to reverse direction of refrigerant flow and provide the building with heat. So they're, they're very, very similar to an air conditioner. And there's really five main components to a heat pump. Uh, there's the indoor coil, which we, we talked about, and this acts as a condenser, um, and it rejects the heat, brings the heat inside in heating mode. Um, the outdoor coil, which is the evaporator and, and collects heat from the outside. Uh, the compressor, which is a vapor pump, um, and it's kind of the heart of the system. Uh, a metering device, which controls the refrigerant flow. And then the, the reversing valve uh, that, that transforms basically an air conditioner into a heat pump and is, allows it to go from heating to cooling mode. So why, why would you want to consider ductless um, for multifamily properties? Um, it's going to be the best practical solution uh, for, for a number of reasons. It's going to be easiest to install, um, really short installation times, um, really kind of non-invasive. Um, it doesn't interfere, interfere with the occupants because it goes so quickly. Uh, no major remodels or anything like that required for duct work. Um, highest efficiencies. Uh, so SEER is a seasonal energy efficiency ratio, and it's a way, um, it's kind of a standard for an efficiency rating uh, over, a over the season for cooling. Um, so for ductless, we see units with um, up to 22 SEER. And to put things in perspective, um, the current minimum standard for heat pumps um, and air conditioners is 13 SEER. Um, so much more efficient than um, you know, a, a standard a standard heat pump. Uh, the heat, HSPF is known as the heating seasonal performance factor, and it's kind of the SEER equivalent for the heating season. And so we're seeing uh, HSPF numbers of 11, uh, up to 11. And the federal minimum right now for HSPF is 7.7. .7. So again, uh, considerably, uh, considerably higher efficiency compared to uh, federal minimum standards. And uh, lowest cost. Um, it's probably going to be the lowest cost option if you're looking to improve efficiency over um, electric resistance, baseboard, um, wall heaters, and ceiling cable heat. Uh, they're also extremely quiet. Um, this is important for a multifamily setting where maybe you have these units outside, um, the units are close together. Uh, the outdoor units are, are very, very quiet and, and aren't going to disturb the neighbors. Um, the indoor units are also also very quiet. And uh, ductless, uh, ductless heat pumps are a proven technology. Uh, they've been around a long time. And they're, they're only new to the U.S., but, but becoming more and more popular.
So a little more specifically on how ductless heat pumps work. Um, ductless heat pumps move heat from outdoors to indoors with efficiency up to three times greater than zonal electric heat. Uh, moves heat from indoors to outdoors to provide cooling. The units, uh, generally, they use one outdoor unit, and then you can use anywhere from one to four indoor units. And I'll talk a little bit more about installation strategies uh, here in, in some of the upcoming slides, uh, but there are different configurations that you can choose when selecting um, uh, ductless heat pumps. Uh, each indoor unit is individually controlled by a remote control. And uh, backup electric resistance is not required, and system can operate efficiently at very low outdoor temperatures. Um, they tend to perform a lot better than uh, ducted heat pumps in, in lower outdoor temperatures. And as far as the, the, not, the lack of need for electric resistance, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in some upcoming slides, and that comes down to installation strategies and kind of evaluating costs and so on and in terms of how you want to utilize these ductless heat pumps. And the, the ductless heat pumps, uh, one feature that you're looking for, and most of the product that's available out there today has this um, variable capacity or inverter technology. And you might think of your maybe your air conditioner or if you have a standard heat pump uh, in your home, the, the units cycle on and off. And uh, that's not the most efficient way to operate a compressor. Um, the most efficient operation is to, to vary the capacity as for the heating and cooling uh, demand. And that's what this variable capacity does. So, you know, it may be a time of moderate outdoor temperature in the, uh, in terms in the heating season, and um, it's it's only operating at partial capacity. It's just slowed down, so it it, it really reacts quickly to the need, heating and cooling needs um, in the in the apartment or or wherever it's installed. A little history on ductless heat pumps. Um, ductless heat pumps were developed in Japan over 30 years ago. Um, they've been around a long time. It's it's proven technology. It works. Uh, for those of you who have traveled uh, much outside the United States, um, ductless heat pumps are commonly found um, and used for heating and cooling in Asia and Europe and, and really um, almost everywhere in the world. Um, they're a, a popular heating and cooling option. We've seen a significant increase in uh, U.S. Installation, installations over the last few years, uh, particularly, particularly in our region, the Northwest. Um, and, and one of the reasons for this is, uh, remember, NIA, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, who, uh, who I spoke about um, in some previous slides, um, had an initiative um, to get a lot of these heat pumps uh, installed um, in residential settings, and there were over 11,000 ductless heat pump installations over the last several years. So we really have a lot of these systems out there that customers are very happy with and are working and performing very well uh, here in our region. So we get a, as a utility, we get a lot of feedback uh, on on technologies uh, that our customers are using, and I just wanted to share um, some of the common themes and comments that we get from our customers uh, about ductless heat pumps. So they're excited that they now have cooling or a better form of cooling. Um, the the home the, the home's heated better, especially if they're used to baseboard heaters. Uh, there's a lot better air distribution. Um, the indoor units with the ductless heat pumps, um, when they're on like a maximum capacity, they're still very quiet, uh, but they're throwing the air as far as 20 feet out. So um, very good at air distribution. And of course, uh, we've, we've covered the efficiency benefits. Um, lower utility bills uh, are something that customers are always happy to, happy to see. Um, amazed at how quiet uh, the, the units are, and that's, that goes for both indoor and outdoor units. Uh, hot supply air temperature. Um, there is, is warmer than a typical heat pump with ducts. With a, with a typical heat pump, um, there's some temperature loss as the air is distributed through the duct system. Um, and in general, ductless heat pumps just provide a hotter supply air temperature. 
Um, I've taken some temperature um, readings out of the ductless heat pumps, even in, in you know, let's say 40 degree temperature, and I've found supplier temperatures, you know, between 110, 120 degrees. So pretty warm air coming out of these units. And they like the ability to control uh, the different rooms with an efficient heat source. Um, and this is the case when uh, multiple indoor units are, are used. And it's typically seen in um, larger residences um, and, and larger homes in particular, single family homes. So there are uh, several ins installation strategies that can be looked at um, when you're considering a ductless heat pump system. Um, so a single indoor unit is going to offer the lower installation costs. So you're going to have every system is going to have the outdoor unit, and then you can choose additional indoor units. So this is just one indoor unit, one outdoor unit. Uh, the installation cost is going to be significantly lower. Um, the strategy is to locate in the main living area. So if you have an apartment, um, maybe you have a living room and kitchen area that's all kind of open, and then some maybe some bedrooms down a short hallway. Um, install the indoor unit in the main living area and maybe in a place where it can send um, the air down the hallway too to help heat the bedrooms. Um, one of the benefits is, is there's going to be less impact on the exterior of the building. Typically, um, the refrigerant lines uh, are run outside uh, the building. Um, I'll show you some pictures here in a few minutes of what that looks like. Um, and it works, this strategy works great for smaller single family homes and apartments. Um, even the, the air, the, the warm air tends to migrate towards um, the bedrooms and uh, actually keep them warm enough that our people are comfortable. So the baseboards and wall heaters in the bedrooms um, will not frequently be used. Um, in some cases, they've, they've actually, uh, people are actually turning them off at the breakers because they're, they're just not needed. Um, I was involved in, in looking into an installation that had um, the baseboards disabled, and I did some temperature monitoring, and uh, I found that the temperature wasn't that much, and this was probably a 750 square foot apartment um, unit, and the temperature really didn't vary that much between the bedrooms and the, um, the space where the, the ductless, single, single head ductless heat pump unit was located. Um, so multiple outdoor, indoor units, I mean, it's something that, that you could consider. Um, there's the potential for more energy savings uh, because you're able to zone the residence without the, the use of a electric resistance heat. But again, for a small apartment, prob probably not necessary. So what will the system look like? Uh, there's the outdoor unit, uh, typically mounted on the ground or a patio on a pad that's designed to support the unit. Uh, there's also the option to have an elevated um, unit that's mounted on a bracket on the exterior wall. And sometimes that's done if uh, uh, it's on a, on a second floor or something or, or there's other limitations on, on ground installations or that's just what the customer uh, or the building owner chooses to do. Uh, so several options there. Uh, there's the refrigerant lines, which connect the indoor to outdoor units. Uh, the refrigerant lines, the power communications, um, all that is kind of combined um, and requires a three inch hole in the exterior of the wall to connect the indoor and outdoor unit. And then there's a, a rigid cover um, that, that really should be installed um, that conceals the refrigerant power and communication wiring. Um, it basically looks like a gutter downspout and can be painted to match the building. Um, so you, you really don't even notice that, that, that there is this, or this system that's, that's requiring this um, um, refrigerant line and, and, and cable and all this. So um, Indoor units, they mount close to the ceiling height. Uh, they're approximately three feet wide and about a foot tall. So here's a, a couple photographs of a apartment installation. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on this installation, and I'll, I'll use my arrow here. Um, you can kind of see the, the edge of my green arrow, but this is the this is the cover. The, 
on the outdoor unit to the left, you can see the refrigerant lines, the, the, the black, uh, black lines going up the wall. And um, then you can see that there's, there's this cover that's been painted the same color as the house. And look, look, it, looks, it looks like a gutter downspout. You can't tell it's there. Uh, it looks like the unit's installed on a, a pad design to support the unit and then on some sort of um, pavers or something. And then on the right-hand uh, side, we just have uh, the indoor unit, just to kind of give you a sense of, of, of what it looks like. Here's another example. This is a high-rise installation. This was in downtown Portland. Um, it was actually a, pro, a fairly large size condo. I think it was about 2,400 square feet or so. Um, this system actually utilized two uh, outdoor indoor units rather uh, due to the size of the of the building it was about 11 floors up and, and wrapped around the, it, was the, it was it was a corner unit so um, to heat this this place adequately they did do multiple units um, so you can see up and to the right there's the indoor unit there and then the outdoor unit sitting on the patio um, another unit just went um, through the other sliding glass door which is behind the outdoor unit there was another uh, indoor unit installed there as well So operation and maintenance. Maintenance, um, washable filters sh should be, they have, these units have washable filters typically. Uh, they should be cleaned several times a year. It's important to have uh, adequate airflow over the indoor unit. And um, this should just be common maintenance uh, practice. And uh, expected life is up to 20 years, um, given that they've been around a long time. Um, it's been proven that they've, uh, they have, uh, have a good lifespan. And operation, um, so the operating modes are, are generally heating, cooling, or auto. And for most efficient operation, uh, we suggest operating in heating or cooling mode according to whatever season you're in. Uh, and avoid cha significant changes in settings. So heat pumps are a little bit different than um, like a wall heater, for example, or a baseboard. Um, since their heat pumps rely on bringing outdoor air outdoor heat from the outdoors to heat the, the indoor space. It takes a little more time for uh, the temperature to rise um, with a heat pump. So if you had a really big setback, let's say, you know, 10 or 12 degrees or something like that, it might, it might take a, a little bit of time for um, the temperature to recover. Um, it should still be fairly quick, but something to keep in mind, maybe not have as deep setbacks as you would with a zonal electric system. And uh, keep temperature settings in the room, in the bedrooms, five uh, to 15 degrees cooler than in the area with the, where the ductless heat pump is located. Um, we want the, the ductless heat pump to be the primary um, heat source. And again, um, so that warm air is going to the cooler areas where the, where the baseboards are located and the baseboards aren't, aren't operating or operating very little. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about an example, just a, a local project um, that was done. This is one of our, our customers who owned who owns a 80-unit apartment complex. Um, in this particular apartment complex, uh, there were it was 20 years the units were 20 years old, uh, with 20-year-old baseboard heaters. Um, the the building owner, apartment owner, replaced um, the the baseboard heaters with ductless heat pumps. And the tenants reported savings of fifty to sixty dollars per month during the heating season. Um, so it's important to know. I mean, savings really is going to vary uh, depending on a, on a lot of factors. Um, how efficient the building is, you know, insulation levels, occupancy, uh, how often the space is occupied and heated. Um, a, a lot of factors that go into this. But in this example, this is this is this is the feedback that uh, the tenants gave the. Um, Gave the apartment owner, and the the tenants were extremely satisfied with uh, with their upgraded heating systems, and the owner raised rent to recoup the cost. And I was just going to go over a few of the a few photos of the actual this actual installation that I'm referring to. Um, you can see this is just a, a close up uh, of what the indoor unit looked like, and then the the controller thermostat as well that's remote. 
then taking a step back, uh, just this just gives you an idea of what it looks like um, actually installed uh, in in the unit. Um, what I found is, is when customers have installed ductless heat pumps, sometimes they are they question, oh, this you know I don't know what this is going to look like. And actually, most people find that they like it so much, and it just kind of blends in with the wall. It's the same color; they they hardly even notice it's there. So I just want to kind of give you perspective of of uh, of what it looks like uh, when installed in the room. And again, this is the same um, the same apartment complex. Uh, and here's the outdoor unit. Uh, one of the things I wanted to know is some of the previous pictures, it showed the ground mounted installations. Um, I'm not sure why the particular uh, building owner chose to install uh, an elevated unit, but um, that, that choice was made and it gives you an idea of what a unit looks like when it's on a, on a mounting bracket, uh, exterior mounting bracket. Talk about the landlord perspective a little bit. Um, so maybe the landlord's goals are, are to increase tenant comfort and happiness. Uh, of course, increase tenant retention, uh, decrease or elim eliminate vacancy, uh, greater cash flow or more rent, rent per month. And, and then we'll talk about the tenant's perspective and your tenant's possible economics um, when considering a, a ductless heat pump. So possible winter savings uh, with the new system. Uh, let's use an example of maybe $50 per month in the winter. And then there's added, what's the added value for air conditioning? Is it 25, 50, or, or maybe even $75 a month uh, for that, that feature and benefit? And now back to the landlord perspective and, and looking at your possible economics from a, from a payback period. Uh, so a ductless heat pump, uh, we'll just throw out a number and say $2,900 after incentives. Um, monthly rent increase of $75 would result in a 3.2 year payback. So not, not a bad investment from a payback perspective. And then looking at return on investment or internal rate of return, uh, so you spend $2,900, uh, you get $75 a month, uh, term of uh, 60 months, and that results in a 16.7% internal, internal rate of return. So why tenants move, and this is a per HUD, uh, there's a number of reasons. It could be to start a family, job relocation, costs, or other. And, and other can be a lot of things. Uh, it could be safety and security, uh, atmosphere, heating and cooling, noise, uh, unhealthy environment, whether it's real or perceived, uh, amenities or lack of, so things like schools, parks, transportation, um, whether there's a Starbucks or other um, other retail or or restaurant that's located in their in their vicinity. So, uh, which can you affect? So, improving comfort is one of the thing, one of the ways that you can um, make an influence. And installing a ductless heat pump is a better way to heat and cool. Um, they're going to be you're going to see a lot higher uh, efficiency compared to window air conditioners, which a lot of tenants are using already. Um, and lower costs operate than, than zonal electric heating, which we've talked about. And cooling, if, if, you, do, if you don't provide it, uh, they typically will, and they being the tenant. So a lot of times you'll see uh, tenants using um, portable air conditioners, which have a variety of names, uh, sometimes known as window shakers or room AC. Um, they got the name Window Shaker because um, they're loud, um, very noisy. Um, they're not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Uh, blights on the architecture, they're ugly. And there's, all, there's potential for uh, water intrusion. So a lot of times you'll see these units um, installed year round just because the tenant doesn't want to remove it during the winter. Um, and there's potential for water intrusion um, from rain um, and weather you know, if it's installed year round, um, or even the condensate that the, the unit produces 
um, could could get into the to the wall structure and, and cause damage. Also, it's a security issue. Uh, potentially easier for you know burglars to get in, break-ins, and so on. And uh, liability could, could be a concern as well. Um, in the picture here, we have um, uh, window air conditioner supported by I think VHS cassettes and uh, some sort of tape. Um, maybe not the best idea or the best, uh, most secure installation. And, and you know, what if this was under installed over you know two floors up over a walkway, common walkway or something? Um, maybe not the safest, uh, safest installation done by tenants. Comparing options. So traditional ducted, syst uh, ducted system heat pump disadvantages. Um, uh, a ducted system is a more technical install. Um, the installation requires uh, proper airflow, which means duct sizing requirements um, and, other, and other considerations. So if done incorrectly, um, there's reduced equipment life. So um, if there's not enough airflow, it could, it could harm the compressor, for example. Um, and if done incorrectly, there's reduced savings, reduced airflow, um, also resu results in savings that, that, less, that are less than what the equipment manufacturer specs and what it's been tested at. And if replacing a zonal system, adding ductwork can be expensive or impossible. And I imagine in a lot of cases with multifamily properties, um, it would be impossible to, or almost impossible to uh, install ducts uh, in units, especially when you're talking about uh, multi-level and so on, and uh, gonna be considerably more expensive. Um, than, than the ductless option. So some of the advantages of uh, ductless heat pumps, ease of installation, they go in very quickly um, without really uh, having to um, have the tenant get, uh, have, be out of, the, out of the space for very long or anything like that. In fact, they could probably be around. Um, if it's zoned, uh, additional energy savings in, in larger in larger spaces that that would require zoning. Uh, extremely high extremely high energy efficiency uh, compared to ducted systems. No ductwork and no ductwork uh, energy losses. So it's pretty common. A common number might be 20% that you lose right off the bat through ductwork um, that's eliminated with a ductless system. Uh, of course, they're going to be very quiet and uh, a much more compact outdoor unit. So typically the unit is gonna be about the size of a large suitcase, uh, let's say. I know it's maybe hard to tell uh, the perspective from some of the pictures, but basically that's what the, that's what the size is, large suitcase. While there aren't a lot of disadvantages um, for ductless heat pumps, um, there are some considerations. Um, a premium product may have a premium price, so do your homework. Make sure you're paying a, a reasonable price for the system. Um, some contractors are, are unfamiliar with the technology, and so if they've been doing something, installing ducted systems for 30 years, maybe they don't know about ductless systems or the benefits. Um, we've actually see, seen this as something that's been less of a concern, uh, especially the last couple of years. Um, most contractors are actually embracing this technology because their customers are happy um, with the systems that are installed, and they're selling more and more of these um, ducted systems or ductless systems. And it also suggests that you require deposits for remote controls, so there's always the potential for tenants to lose or, or damage uh, the remote controls, and, and you can kind of put that on the tenant in terms of holding them responsible for, for making sure they take care of the, um, the remotes. Uh, so the PGE has a, uh, a network of uh, approved contractors, and um, we're actually having a promotion right now with uh, several approved contractors for the installation of a um, single-head indoor unit ductless heat pump. Uh, $3,598 from PG approved contractor. Uh, the product is Frederick Duckless Heat Pump System. Um, and I believe that includes everything in a, in a kind of a standard installation except the permit, because that, that's gonna vary um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, there's a $600 energy trust incentive that's available. 
uh, $200 PGE approved contractor discount, and uh, the 20th system is free. So if you if you really want to go all out and, and install a lot of these systems, uh, 20 or more, then then there's a free one there. Um, so we do have some information. If you're wanting to have a contractor get in touch with you and maybe get a quote for this type of system, I've, I've listed the the unique web address for this particular offer. I'll leave it up here just for a minute so you can write it down. So in the previous slide, I mentioned the Energy Trust of, of Oregon, and I wanted to talk just for a minute about the Energy Trust, who they are and what they do. Uh, so the Energy Trust of Oregon is a nonprofit organization. Um, what they're dedicated uh, to do is to help Oregonians uh, save energy by offering incentives for improvements to uh, residential buildings, multifamily buildings, commercial buildings, um, and even industrial customers. So the Energy Trust is funded by a public purpose charge that uh, the PGE customers pay on their monthly bill. Um, the Energy Trust, in turn, uses this money to develop programs and incentives um, where you can improve the efficiency of your um, multifamily units. And so I, I know we're, we're really focused on, on, on ductless heating and cooling today, but it is important to know that there are a number of incentives for, for different types of uh, energy efficiency improvements, such as attic floor and exterior wall insulation, um, clothes washers, so for in your laundry rooms or, or even for individual units, if that's something that you're providing, um, Energy Star units, front loaders, for example. Um, common area lighting, and a lot of larger uh, apartment uh, complexes are going to have common area lighting, maybe the older uh, T12 lighting that's been phased out and you want to upgrade to T8s. Um, Customized solutions for HVAC and water heating. So maybe you own a larger building with uh, central HVAC systems or water heating systems. There's um, maybe custom projects that could be done. Uh, exterior doors, or even if you heat with gas, um, tune-ups and boiler pipe insulation, boiler upgrades. Um, Energy Trust offers uh, incentives for, for units with, that are heated with gas as well. Uh, heat pumps. Uh, both standard and ductless, so I think we've covered that. Um, common items that you replace on a regular basis, you can get incentives for. So refrigerators, um, if you go with Energy Star refrigerators, there's an incentive. They'll actually take your old refrigerator and pay you to do that um, as well to recycle it. Water heaters, another commonly replaced um, appliance or, or device in apartment units. If you go with high efficiency um, water heaters that meet the Energy Trust criteria, you can get an incentive for that as well. Um, Windows are also popular, save energy, and uh, um, also um, are, in, are an upgrade in terms of the appearance of the building. So the Energy Trust does offer um, on-site building ass assessments for um, apartment owners. PGE also helps connect its customers to the Energy Trust and um, the incentives that the Energy Trust provides. So maybe, um, if, you, if you're interested in finding out more uh, about um, ductless heat pumps or other programs that are available, um, portlandgeneral.com forward slash business. Um, you can kind of use this checkbox as, as your next steps. Um, you can contact Paula Conway, who is one of our commercial outreach specialists. Um, we don't typically go on site for the multifamily, although we do for um, traditional commercial buildings. Uh, Paula can answer questions about ductless heat pumps um, or any other potential measures that you might have questions about that the Energy Trust offers incentives for. So there's her phone number um, and also her email address. And then the special offer that I mentioned um, for, for the ductless heat pump uh, through PGE approved contractors, um, there's the, the web address for that as well. Um, so I'll leave that up just for a moment before I pass it back to Lorena and she'll kind of uh, go over any questions that, that you may have had and, and that I could answer. Um, so with that, back to you, Lorena. Great, thank you, Garrett. And again, as a reminder, we will be sending these uh, materials to you with a recording of the session after, oh, within a couple days. Um, I want to, before we go into the questions, I want to remind you that we do have another webinar on saving with appliance on March 20th, where we'll go more in depth uh, with other uh, appliances and technologies to consider uh, for your um, 
for your uh, properties. Um, and we had the uh, water consortium representative that will be talking about some of their um, available you know, rebates and then also the Energy Trust of Oregon who will go more in depth with some other uh, appliances that have incentives currently. We also have three luncheon presentations if you'd like to join us on that, energy and water savings, irrigation trends, and then investment strategies, and energy benchmarking. You'll notice on the right side of your screen, we had a polling that, uh, survey that came up. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out and provide your feedback for us, um, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the questions. And Gary, I'd like to um, get um, Bart on, on here. Bart has a question for you, so he's going to ask you the question out loud. So okay. Bart? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, I had a contractor come out, and I looked at this about uh, 18 months ago, and there's a lot of positives with it, and I'm sure the tenants would love it. But the thing that threw me was that the contractor told me it was about the cost of $2,900 per unit, but he also told me that it was going to be cost me at least a hundred dollars per unit per year for maintenance, and I just don't understand that. That that's way high, as far as I can see. Okay, if, if, what, what, if, 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 he was saying that for every unit I installed, it was going to cost me a hundred dollars a year to have it maintained. If I've got twelve units, that's twelve hundred dollars a year I'm spending every year out of pocket having this thing maintained. And I thought to myself. This just can't be the okay. case. The the, the maintenance. Yeah. 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 I, I, I would say that you probably would. You, you could probably get away with not having them checked. Um. You know, annually. Um. Since it is a refrigeration system, you'd probably want to get it checked. You know, serviced several years. Uh. Every several years. But really, I mean, if you're changing the 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 indoor air filters regularly, cleaning them, um, you, you should be good for for several years. So the washable filters are they inside the unit or outside the unit? They're the, they're on the, they're in the indoor unit. They're, so the indoor unit. So you have to get access to the unit through the tenant and say I want to clean the filter. Correct. Okay. Or the or the, or the tenant. So so maybe it's within your you know if you do um, quarterly inspections or something like that of the unit yeah. so that, that might. That's be fine. That's, that, that's not an issue. I just want, I didn't know whether the filter the washable filter was inside or outside. It's much like a furnace filter that you would have, like in in your furnace or or air conditioner. Yeah, yeah. So you think that you could get by with having it maintained maybe once every two years? Yeah, I think that would be acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That that was my question. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Yep. Um. I also um. The next question, Garrett, um, came um from another participant, and they'd like to know. Um, why is backup heating, such as electric resistant coils, not required in winter cold temperatures? Um, well, it's it, it's not required. Um, so it, typically, if you would in, install, like let's say, let's use an example of a, a 750 square foot apartment, um, you might even use the wiring from the the baseboards to supply um, the power to the indoor unit. Uh, indoor and outdoor unit. Um, so it basically, it, it eliminates the need to have uh, electric baseboard heat or, or, or unit heaters um, inside the unit. And the ductless, at least in that area for certain, um, and the, the performance characteristics of the ductless heat pump, they perform very well um, at low temperatures, and, and that's relative to, to a standard heat pump. Um, the compressors can be overdriven, and they, you can get a lot of heat out of out of these systems at, at lower temperatures. And uh, what we found is is that even the heat moving from the warm areas, that main body, um, to the bedrooms, um, it actually works pretty well if you if you leave the doors open. So there are times where, let, let's say, in the bedrooms in a single um, indoor unit installation that I've described, that, that you may need to use the backup heat, but but probably relatively infrequently, if if at all. Great, thanks, Garrett. Um, the next question is: um, Electrical power required if you're converting a gas wall heater? Um, well, I mean, in terms of that, that would be a question for for an electrician, and we're not encouraging um, 
folks from from going from from gas to electric, and they actually the Energy Trust doesn't offer incentives to um, to to replace gas with uh, a ductless heat pump. But in terms of the uh, of the question on the electrical wiring, that would be a question for an ele electrician um, or the HVAC contractor as far as wiring requirements. Great, thanks, Garrett. And the last question, unless somebody else wants to ask one out loud, please raise your hand with the, with the raise hand icon. Um, is um, does by you adding um, several units, does that decrease the efficiency of the heat pump? Um, no, no. Adding several units doesn't decrease the the efficiency uh, of the heat pump. Um, it, it, generally, for if we're talking about apartments, it, it's not absolutely um, necessary. Uh, but no, no. To answer the question, it doesn't decrease the efficiency to have more than one unit. Okay. I thought I saw someone raise their hand. Maybe. Okay. So um, with that, um, again, we're going to send the recording of the session, but I do want to put it back to the slide if somebody asked about the website for the special offering. It's portlandgeneral.com forward slash biz offer. If you want to visit that website to find out about that special, and then you get the 20th free. Um, so there it is. And again, we'll be following up with information. And if you do want to take advantage of the real estate continued education units, please let us know and, or follow up with an email, and we'll get you uh, started on that process. And again, try to join us at the rest of the educational series. And um, thanks again, Garrett, and thank you, thank you everyone for joining us.